This week on Wealth Track, 35 years in, why great value investor Tom Russo continues to follow Warren Buffett's investment principles. Russo is next on Consuelo Mack Wealth Track. Funding provided by Clearbridge Investments, a Leg Mason company, Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective, Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences, and the Fairholm Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Berkshire Hathaway stock has underperformed the S&P 500 for the past decade. By a recent calculation, Berkshire stock has risen by nearly 260 percent versus the market's more than 300 percent advance in the decade ended in 2018. Despite Berkshire's stunning record since 1965, 21 percent compounded annualized gains, this is not the first time that the company's shares have underperformed the market for a decade. It's happened several times in recent years. Take a look at this chart from S&P Dow Jones Indices. It shows the trailing 10-year difference in performance between Berkshire and the S&P since the 10 years before 1978. Buffett took control of Berkshire in 1965. As you can see, Berkshire has outperformed the market by double digits in every trailing 10-year period since 1978. But it hasn't had a double-digit advantage since 2002, and in recent years it has underperformed the market in three 10-year spans. Even Warren Buffett himself admitted the company's glory days of outperformance are over. In an interview in the Financial Times, his response to the question if Berkshire would be a better investment than the S&P 500, he said, I think the financial result would be very close to the same. He went on to say, if you want to join something that may have a tiny expectation of better performance than the S&P, I think we may be about the safest. At $500 billion in market cap and few places to deploy it in enough size to make a discernible difference to the bottom line, is Berkshire just too big? Over the years, Berkshire Hathaway has benefited from sizable stock buybacks in some of its major holdings. In Berkshire's 2018 annual report, Buffett cited American Express, where its holdings remain unchanged over the past eight years, but its ownership increased from 12.6% to 17.9% because of repurchases. In the same letter to shareholders, Buffett said the company itself will be a significant repurchaser of its shares at prices below our estimate of intrinsic value. What else does Buffett have up his sleeve to enhance shareholder returns? The company has never purchased a tech stock. It recently bought Amazon and Buffett heaped praise on CEO Jeff Bezos. Berkshire has never paid a dividend. Could that be next? This week's guest is a longtime holder of Berkshire stock, avid student of Buffett's style of value investing, and has no intention of changing his approach. He is Tom Russo, managing partner of investment advisory firm Gardner Russo & Gardner, where he oversees approximately $11 billion, including his Sempervic Partners Funds, which he launched in 1984 after hearing Buffett address his class at Stanford. Sempervic has generated 14% compound annual returns since inception, handily outperforming the S&P 500's 11% returns. The global value manager focuses on owning a small group of exceptionally well-managed brand name firms, 19 at last count, with dominant, almost unassailable positions in their mostly consumer-oriented businesses, and then holding them pretty much forever. Berkshire Hathaway has consistently been one of his largest positions. I asked Russo, given Buffett's modest expectations for the stock's future performance, if he is rethinking the position. No, I think, I think the number one um, uh, issue that investors obtain, a uh, benefit that they obtain through investing in Berkshire Hathaway is, is the extraordinary lack of agency costs. Berkshire Hathaway is by far and away the most efficient investment in, in public markets one could have in, in aligning the interests of the shareholders with the managers. And, and, and within the S&P 500, that continuum would be stretched awfully thin. It's largely because within the S&P 500, most of the companies that you find there have a very serious relationship with stock options. 
which unfortunately in terms of the way businesses unfold, narrows and shortens the time horizon of investment decisions. So and what CEOs we're for. In, in most S&P 500 companies get a lot of stock options. Tremendous incentives. And therefore based. there is incentive to yes. jack up the stock short yes. term? Is that, yes. to yes. think short term? The average CEO, 10 years, four years, maybe five years, and the whole system is built around smooth and steady reports for the near term uh, with the disregard for the long term. And, and, and then there's a sequence of that rolling through this S&P 500 all the time. Now, initially, a little alignment of, of equity alongside of salary was a good thing. But as Warren Buffett often says, the mistakes on Wall Street are good things taken to an extreme. And within the S&P 500, it's rife with, with agency costs. And so within Berkshire, that's entirely solved. Uh, Berkshire does nothing but try to develop on an intrinsic value on a per share basis investments that increase that measure. That's it. There's there no, no other fees. side games, right. no other side games whatsoever. And, and with that, um, I'm entirely in content to leave close to 13 or 14 percent of my investors funds exposed to that to that enterprise led as it's been by such extraordinary talent, but but set up the right way uh, to succeed w when there's a shift in the talent because it's a structure that's set up to uh, align interests. Right. Um, as I alluded to in, in my introductory remarks to you, yes. is that if you look back at trailing 10-year periods, yes. several of them, the Berkshire has underperformed yeah. the S&P 500. Yes. Now, if you buy an S&P 500 type of index, yes. which of course Warren Buffett has recommended that yes. you know, many people yes. do, yes. Um, you've got much broader diversity. And uh, and so why wouldn't I invest in an S and P five hundred index? A, it's a very good question. I think Warren's message um, has some some deeper complexity to it than what it seems on the surface. Mm -hmm. What he's really saying to all whom he advises uh, invest in the S and P five hundred, if their decision maker parts the parts the scene and they're left to make decisions that they're unfamiliar with, his advice is go to the S&P because it'd be very hard for you to find any person mm -hmm. who would handle your money without self-dealing. Mm -hmm. It's again I a see. question of agency costs. Right. So the first point behind the S&P 500 is make sure that you um, go to the S&P 500 rather than a selection of portfolio companies because those will be churned. And as they're churned, they will eat, eat up your money mm -hmm. into commissions for the, for the um, intermediary. Now, within, within the S&P 500, you at least, however, get Productivity of America. Right. And Warren would tell you that actually backing America has been a, the winning trade for over 250 years. And that will continue. Now, I submit that, as I said at the start, Yes, you get, the, you get the benefit of corporate America diluted by options and the mm -hmm. mistakes that are made by the failure for companies to invest enough. But at least within the S&P 500, you're not subject to the grabbing of your assets by, by, dis, by interested intermediaries. Right. And then the last thing he says, stay in it. Yes. Because if no, never you sell. come out, right. um, there's a chance if you come out, you will, you will as a lay person, inevitably find yourself within the S&P world um, mortgaging your house to get more money to throw at the S&P when it peaks, and you'll be clearly sold out at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So the, the advice is stay put. Um, and, then, and then you'll get the returns from the S&P because 90% of the investors in the S&P 500 funds don't earn the return for that fund mm -hmm. because they're out when the market is most cheap right. and they're over, overexposed when the market's too expensive. Uh, that combination will, and then keep some bonds on the side so you have something to live with, mm -hmm. so, you, so you can let the equities run without worrying about be, you know, becoming poor if you don't have backup. Uh, it's good advice. Mm -hmm. the, uh, one of the other kind of, I guess, significant developments, and when I'm, when I'm thinking about the evolution of, uh, of the Buffett and Munger yes. style of value investing, is that their, their use or their willingness to buy back stock. Yes. And they, I think Munger, you know, he's so understated. He, you know, he said, well, we will be more liberal in our, yeah, uh, <laughs> in our repurchasing uh, of shares yes, or something. Yes. Um, you applauded that. Yes. You think that Berkshire should be more liberal yes. in its repurchasing of its shares. It's, yeah. Why? Why is that a significant development? It's an important arrow in their quiver. Mm -hmm. And not to have the use of it. Um, 
it limits their ability to pull levers, which will build intrinsic value on a per share basis. Mm -hmm. And where that occurs is if they are able to buy back the shares at a big discount to Which is what they said they value. wanted to do. Yep. Right. That and and do when, when, they, when they can do that, they're going to increase the intrinsic value on a per share basis of what remains. Now, Warren and Charlie take seriously their, their stated responsibilities to treat their investors like partners. Mm -hmm. And so what you see now is Warren, Warren is now announcing Again and again, it's now, it's now the third or fourth time he's announced the willingness to buy back shares. But different, he hasn't really done it yet. Mm -hmm. What I'm looking for from Berkshire is that they come away with something like a five or ten billion dollar buyback over the course of this year or next, mm -hmm. so that when it comes time for complete successors to to run the show, that they don't face the uh, the argument from shareholders. Well, Warren never did it. I see. Um, so it, it give needs them to the be freedom. well exercised. Uh -huh in order to have the authority to do it later on. Right. And so I think that'll be a very, very important thing. There's another aspect to the possibility of buying back shares of Berkshire as well. And you feel that they're being very transparent about when they purchase shares back from share, uh, shareholders out there, yes. that they know what you know, they're getting, how to evaluate the yes. company's stock price, exactly. right? Exactly. Recently, in this year's annual report, for example, they, they declared that, that Geico is worth $50 billion more than when they bought it as a result of Tony Dicey's work. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the, the CEO of he's Geico. He's the CEO of Geico. Two years earlier, they said that C's had generated Andy. $2 billion of cash mm -hmm. over its holding period within Berkshire to help Berkshire finance acquisitions. Well, that number leads you to think that the company itself would be worth something like $2 billion. Mm -hmm. And with that information, you can construct a closer estimate of the value of Berkshire, which, which will help you if you're inclined to sell some for whatever reason. But Berkshire will be in the business of share buyback after, after um, the, the current team leaves. And I think they will be most likely involved with the dividend, mm -hmm. as well as a way to keep the capital that keeps pouring into Berkshire from the existing business flowing through uh, into buybacks to, to right. um, well, as long as the shares are below their intrinsic value, and dividends to help the many foundations who rely on Berkshire as their core holding to have a distribution which they can use uh, for meeting their 5% payout requirements. And so I, I would think that over time you'd see both a robust share buyback program as well as a, sh a, a share of a, a, a cash dividend. Ben Graham was very critical of companies. This is according to an article in yes. the Wall Street Journal by Jason Zweig. Yeah. Was very critical of companies that hoarded cash. Mm -hmm. There is a company named Berkshire Hathaway that is hoarding a lot of yes. cash. Yes. Cash, when it's necessary, is extremely valuable. Right. Um, cash now at Berkshire is a dead weight balance. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and he said that his returns would be burdened by their right. desire to hold cash. They hold cash, 25, 30 billion dollars worth of it, just for claims paying capabilities. Mm -hmm. Standard business course of insurance, they need to be able to assure the uh, insured that they'll be good for paying. Sure, uh, that's paying part of the, their business. But the, yeah. the additional cash is mounts, not. That mounts because of the yeah. prosperity that they enjoy, and that has to be redeployed. And, and over when the, when the markets are most at stress, right. we have the most valuable cash. And in 2011, when the markets were most at stress, the only person Bank of America offered a 6% preferred to was Berkshire. Because Berkshire's solid cash position, but they could write a check without going to a board, and then in return, um, Bank of America extended to Berkshire um, uh, $7 per share stock options, call options that lasted 10 years and which have since been exercised and have generated to Berkshire shareholders close to $25 billion. Right. As a global value investor, which you are, yes. and uh, you, you, know, you met uh, Warren Buffett when you were at Stanford Business yes. School, you met Charlie Munger when you were at Stanford Law School. Yes and you started your Sempervic Partners yes. Fund yep. um, because you were inspired by Warren Buffett, yes. right? Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, t tell me how Warren has basically directed your yes. investment style. Two points. The first point was um, the question, the, the fact that Warren at our, at our class said the only break the government gives to the non-taxation of unrealized gains. So invest accordingly. Mm -hmm. That's different than the 
than the 50 cent dollar bill approach that he had used as a, as a, as a starting investor when right. he bought liquidating trusts and other uh, other instruments right. and, and that was the that was the ben graham maxim of you know a buying right. sheep you know right. buy a company that's you've analyzed it's worth a dollar a share or whatever yes. and only pay 50 cents for it yes and the margin of safety in that world was price right the discounted price was the margin of safety the trouble is to get a return from that the the assets not growing in value so you have to close the discount mm -hmm. take the cash pay taxes move on try to find another one but the fact is, if you can, in other, in other ways, think of the margin of safety being a business's capacity to reinvest mm -hmm. and the strength of its uh, competitive advantage, um, um, then you don't have to sell. And that's, that really came about just around the time that he presented to our class mm -hmm. because he was in the early st stages of falling in love with C's chocolate, mm -hmm. which unlike anything else he owned before, he could raise prices every year and not have the uh, the demand for the product go away. It right. had price inelastic demand. Mm -hmm. He owned it for uh, forever. He's owned it forever, right? And over the years, it spun off two billion dollars worth of, of caps mm -hmm. that has been invested through Berkshire and other businesses. Now that's a very different business than 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 the old 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 style fifty cent dollar bill. Right. So that's the first lesson. Yes. Oh, the first lesson. The second lesson was you can't make a good deal with a bad person. Mm -hmm. That's agency costs. Mm -hmm. That's when you give your money to a, a third party to invest on your behalf, and they want to, in fact, make it on their behalf. Mm -hmm. and, and that is something that, that is rife in the investment world, and you have to guard against it. That's when I talked about earlier the, uh, the pitfalls and perils of, of uh, stock options. Right, but that's, so the importance of management, it's not just a price metric buying something cheap. Exactly. It's holding something that's yes. valuable, that yes. will return value, yes. but also, so management is key yes, as is. well. The integrity. The integrity. The integrity of that management, right. because what Warren said in the first case, the tax deferral, right. means that you're actually gonna hold something for a long time, and as the cash grows, they, have, they, they will redeploy it. And the question is, in whose interest? Mm -hmm. And what we have to do is make sure that the, the management, when they do redeploy it, are redeploying it in our interest. We actually have to find a couple things. First, the, that, the model Warren described to us, where you're trying to um, defer gains and grow the business, requires that you can reinvest. And for that reason, I end up with 70% of our funds in international companies, mm -hmm. because it's the international marketplace um, that offers the reinvestment, especially in the developing emerging markets. That offers India the reinvestment China. opportunities. Opportunities right. for our companies, for growth. which tend to be businesses that are global at their heart. So right. if you think of the leading holdings that we have, operation companies, it's it's Heineken, it's Nestle, it's, it's right. Diageo, Unilever, Diageo. It's Pernod Ricard, right. All of those companies have fabulous brands and fabulous legacies uh -huh. in the mature markets, and they're able to take their mature market free cash flow and deploy it uh, in, in advance of the uh, demand that will come to them over time abroad. Right. And be, being out there in advance means that the manager who, who's in charge of that process has to have some, some protection against Wall Street when that investment spending burdens near-term income. Right, and so that's Wall the capacity to suffer. That's right, exactly. But, but, so what kind of, and this is probably, yes. it's one of the reasons that you try to own family-owned or family-controlled yes, exactly. businesses yep. because yep. your feeling is that their interests are aligned with the shareholders because yes. they're shareholders. Yes, and they own yes. Them. And so, so that's an important part in, in the capacity yeah. to suffer. So explain the capacity to suffer and, and well, how I think the best example, important and how unusual. I think it's the best example for us has been Heineken. Mm -hmm. I spoke about it, I think, in 2014 or 2015 mm -hmm. with you, but, but it's evolved so interestingly since then. So in 1986, right. when I visited, 85% of their business was done in the mature Western European markets, which were considered moribund and, and only 5% of their business was in North America, and the balance was abroad, very small. Um, Freddie Heineken had just passed away, mm -hmm. and the company began on its journey to invest again, because for the past decade of his life, um, the last decade of his life, he, he pulled in. Okay. But now the company, when I met them, is it, it, beginning they were ready. the process. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, the family controls the company mm -hmm. with a 50.1% voting structure, and they started on the journey. Well, almost every acquisition they made, um, 
Wall Street at the start protested that they were they're not honoring the old um, practices of, of uh, Freddie Heineken, mm -hmm. uh, that they're too expensive, that they're uncertain. And, and every time there's a transaction, uh, the family stood up and said, we're okay with it. And actually, we control it. Mm -hmm. and we're doing this for our grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren. We want this for dynastic returns. And they moved along uh, to the point where today um, they have 65% uh, of their business in developing emerging markets, mm -hmm. wow. which is where they can deploy an enormous amount of capital going forward. I don't think of Google as being yes. a value yes. investors, yeah. especially for you, where yes. you only have 19 holdings in your yes. portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. Why Google? Well, we were led into Google by Heineken. Probably seven years ago, I met with the CEO of North America for Heineken, and he had just come back from a week tour of a week long tour of the Silicon Valley to meet with Google and Yahoo and Twitter and and uh, Facebook and mm -hmm. uh, and maybe maybe not yet Amazon but but the collection of digital advertisers and and the enthusiasm with which he described the kind of targeted messaging that he could create um, rather than the old fashioned advertising which they what they felt increasingly uncomfortable with mm -hmm. because it became increasingly expensive and increasingly ineffective. And of course, David Ogilvy has said, you know, that the problem with advertising, half of it's wasted, but you don't know which half. And so you have to spend. And, and what they came back with, he in fact took his whole board out to, out, to the, out to the West Coast, and they came back with the idea that they needed to transition from that traditional media. And in the process, saving hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. a year in advertising that was ineffectual. And going into the warm embrace of the advertising in search and then also programmatic and more recently uh, platform off of uh, YouTube, there's been an explosion of advertising. Mm -hmm. And that was as early as, you know, seven, five, seven or five years ago. Right. I've been slow. So then you went yeah. and visited. Yes. Uh, right. Yes. And, and they, had, they had just as, as described all that advertising. Uh, plus, they had they had moonshots. They had Google Maps. They were investing in Waymo. Mm -hmm. They're investing in, in um, uh, Verily, which is a, which is the healthcare business, and they're investing in across a range of other items. And and they had the mindset, which is we love to invest with with high pressure, mm -hmm. high expenses up front because we're all about the future. And and they said in their manifesto when Google came public, by the way, public shareholders don't even think about trying to gauge our appetite because we control all the votes, always will, mm -hmm. and we'll do what we want. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how Warren ran his business, and that's how we'd like to run ours. That was effectively right. what the three of them said. So you had both the, the um, growing utility of targeted advertising, um, the growing use of it by our portfolio companies, and their commitment to do what's right for the long term. And that, that was enough to get us started. Berkshire has purchased shares of Amazon. Any yes. interest on yes, your part? Yes, it's a great company. I mean, Jeff Bezos is extraordinary, and one of the great books is um, The Everything Store. Mm -hmm, and it mm -hmm. tells the story, and it's an extraordinary tale of someone who's focused single-mindedly on consumer delight mm -hmm. and, and, and is willing to spend anything up front with reckless abandon in, in terms of its impact for the income statement. That sounds a lot like what I do. Mm -hmm. um, now. It's so stretched out that I haven't been able to really get my arms all around mm -hmm. it, so we don't own it at the moment. Right, right. But it certainly is a fabulous company. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, what would you have all of us own some of? And you, you've said Nestle several times yes. in the past. Yes, yes, yes. It would be Nestle. It, it would be. Amazing, so 1986 is the first time I bought shares in it. Um, I've held them ever since. It's about an 11% position. And today, I think the runway for reinvestment and the team that now runs it um, with a sense of renewed urgency to deliver against that uh, reinvestment promise is, is really first rate. And, and with that, they have a magnificently under leveraged balance sheet um, and they have, without restriction, a, a, a full global universe to invest into. Uh, they, they, they focus on coffee, pet food, uh, and uh, and bottled water. I like it for the, its its infant formula business. It's uh, and, it, and its global reach broadly, and its ability to invest behind the brands that have made it terrific. Tom Russo, thank you so much for being on Wealth Track. It is always thank such you. a pleasure to have you here. Thank, thank you, you very much.
At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. Who better to learn from than the Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett? In his 2018 annual report, he vowed, I will never risk getting caught short of cash. This week's action point, never risk getting caught short of cash. Cash is king, especially when you need it most. Make sure you have a stash on hand to meet those emergencies and opportunities that will and do appear someone least expected. Warren Buffett has vowed that Berkshire will forever remain a financial fortress. In your own much smaller way, it pays to become a personal financial fortress as well. Well, next week, matching the economic might of women with financial knowledge, Yixin Hung, CEO of New York Life Investment Management, discusses her mission to bridge the gap. On this week's extra feature on WealthTrack.com, Tom Russo explains how he is bringing his emphasis on family-owned businesses to his own firm. In the meantime, please continue to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Funding provided by Clearbridge Investments, a leg mason company, Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective, Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences, and the Fairholme Foundation.